When you want somebody to listen to you and actually make a change in their behavior. There are things that will increase the likelihood of that happening and decrease the likelihood of that happening. One thing that will decrease the likelihood of somebody's behavior changing is if you confront them. So right in the top of your danger phrase list, confront, and instead put the word address. I want to address behavior, not confront people. That's a huge key. And I want to make sure that takes a lot of stress off of me as well. I don't have to think in my head, boy, the next time they say this, here's what I'm going to give it. Here's what I'm going to, here's what I'm going to give them. I think to myself, they're not aware that this is happening. I'm going to address this behavior. Even if I believe they are aware that this is happening. You know, even if I've talked to them, I've called them out. I've told them how much this bothers me. We're going to try it one more time. And we're going to walk into that conversation with the attitude of, I'm assuming you do not know the harm that you are doing or you would not do it because most people are human. You know, most people are sensitive beneath the layers that they have to put on because they believe that if they didn't put those layers on, they would somehow be in jeopardy or be threatened in the world. I'm going to assume that you're just like me that way, that I misspeak and I say things out of turn and I say things that hurt other people. And we're going to talk about that so that I can hopefully help and decrease the likelihood of that happening again. That's the attitude I want to go in with, and it's going to be in private. Uh, if you're not a litigious or confronta confrontational person, that will serve you well in these situations because when you can speak to someone on a one-on-one -on -one human level and expose... <laughs> My mother told me, don't say expose yourself, Dan. <laughs> expose your vulnerabilities to them. So really stand in front of them without putting on any armor. We can tell people at the beginning of these types of talks, this is difficult for me. That's okay. People worry about being seen as weak in the workplace. Don't worry about seeing, being seen as weak. Worry about being seen as loving and compassionate and caring and kind. That will serve you more than worrying about being seen as weak. So with those as my mindset, those things as in my mind, I want to come up. I want to speak to this person who's offending me, harassing me, saying these things that are, you know, the bottom line is they are hurtful to me. They are dehumanizing. They are marginalizing me or somebody that I love. I'm assuming that if you're talking about either a man or a woman or an intergendered person, transgendered person, I have somebody that I love that is a brother or a sister that you are talking about. Even if I don't know them, that's my brother or sister you're talking about. That hurts me as a person, keeping that in mind. Number one, I want to start the conversation with Andrew, Trixie, Joe. <laughs> yes, Andrew, you. Andrew, I'm sure you're not aware of this. The reason I want to start with that phrase, so write that on your power phrase list. I want to start out with, I'm sure you're not aware of this, because I want you to know this is not something I believe you're doing on purpose. I'm not, again, accusing you, confronting you. I'm saying, I know that you're not aware of this. Therefore, that takes a lot of the stress out of it and the harshness out of the conversation when you start it with, and in many different types of conversations like this, if you started with, Andrew, I'm sure you're not aware of this. You know, even if you can, you can say it in a fun way, you know, I'm sure you're not aware of this. However, when you say that, you can use many different tones and uh, nuances, but start out with, I am sure you're not aware of this. And by the way, use their name, you know, John, Mary, that just always adds a little personal touch to it. We may think we use people's names a lot, but our name is very rarely said. And remember that it, it is a sweet sound to our ears and creates a little bit of positive drugs to be released from the brain and make us feel good. Use somebody's name. People who use other people's names frequently when they talk are considered to be more likable. So start off being likable, okay? I'm sure you're unaware of this. Then you want to go to step number two. Step number two is, this is one of the top phrases that a, a relationship therapist will teach you to say. So if you have considered going to relationship therapy, I'm going to save you hundreds of dollars with this one phrase. This is the hamburger. Andrew, you'll need this. Are you ready? Okay. Now, the three steps to it. Say this out loud, Andrew. When you... When you... I feel... I feel... Because... Because... Say that again. When you... you I, I feel... feel because. Say it again. When you, I feel because. Now, the average, thank you, Andrew. The average, see now, Andrew, tell me that the average person might say something like, Dan, it makes me uncomfortable when you make those types of sexist jokes. 
That's might, that might be what we want to say, and people will think that they say that. It makes me really uncomfortable when you use that type of language. People will say that. What that is, is a lot of blah, 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 Because when I say to you, it makes me feel uncomfortable. No, it doesn't. You don't make me anything. And people's self-talk will start to increase when you say, you make me, that makes me, it makes me. Mm -mm, it's not even true. It's just ineffective communication. And I also didn't even say what he did. You know, I said, it makes me uncomfortable when you tell jokes like that. <laughs> what about that joke is, should make you feel uncomfortable? What a baby, is what people would think. Instead, Andrew, deliver a message like that to me using the when you I feel because. When you say that, I feel uncomfortable because I have little sisters and I believe you're hurting their sexuality. Oh! Did you <laughs> See, now, how can you argue with that? I mean, really, when you take a message, you know, like if somebody was telling a sexist joke and I were to say, now, you want to say more specifically what I said. When you tell jokes that are dealing with little girls, <laughs> which would be horrible, you know, but like when you tell jokes that are, de that are of a sexual nature, when you use words that are sexually charged, you know, then, I'm, then I would know, oh, you're talking about that, okay. And then he said, that, I, oh, wait, I feel uncomfortable. So far now, there's not one thing that my self-talk could argue with because he's just stating the facts. Then he would say, because I have little sisters and I believe that that hurts them and you know that <laughs> I think that that somehow was going to hurt girls. I would feel awful you know, if, if that were me listening to that because that is not confrontational. That is spelling it out in a way that you may think I've said that. Unless you were scripting it out, you did not. <laughs> Remember that we think we're saying something other than what we're really saying over 50% of the time. And it's the little things, the nuances. Instead of saying, you make me, I simply say, I feel because, you know, when you I feel because. World of difference. When I'm spelling it out, it decreases self-talk. It gets the message crystal clear. And I'm specifically saying what you did. And then... Wait a minute. I want to make sure that I get all my notes in here. Number three. So in step number one, I'm sure you're not aware of this, Trixie. Trixie, I'm sure you're not aware of this. Number two, however, when you, I feel, because. Number three, this is where I'm going to tell you, now that I've said it, I'm going to tell you, I want you to know this is going to remain between you and me. I want you to know this is a private conversation and it's going to remain that way. I want you to know there is no need for this to escalate beyond these four walls. There is no need for this to ever go any further. There should be no need for us to ever talk about this again. And I want you to know you have my word. I will not talk about this with anyone but you again. This. This. <laughs> now, there might be something coming up. In that case, we might need to talk about this. But the purpose of this episode is to increase the odds that that will not happen. And to increase the odds that that will not happen, I want you to feel completely non-threatened, or that, excuse me, unthreatened, that this is a non-threatening communication, conversation. Because the more I try to threaten you, the more I try to say things such as, you know, the next time you say this, or if I hear those types of comments again, or did you know that we could be sued? Well, the more things that I say like that, the more it increases your fear level, your uncomfortable, uh, reactions will start to then come into play. That will trigger a response that will not serve either you or me. The only thing that will serve you or me that I can you know, hope will change this is going to be to appeal to your humanity and to really spell it out to you. When you say things like that, that hurts me. I have, I can always say, as I mentioned at the beginning, I have people that I love. I have people that are in my family that you're talking about and that's hurtful to me. Now after I say that, all of this and that this is this will end here. I just wanted to talk to you about this man to man, woman to man, manager to manager, employee to boss. It could be your boss, you know what I mean? It could be anybody that you're having this conversation with because so far all I'm doing is talking to you on a human level. And then I say, number four, I want you to know that if there were anybody in your family that had to hear things like this and I was there, I would stand up for them just as I'm trying to do now, even though this is really difficult for me. So the message is, the, the, number, the, four, the fourth part is, I want you to know that if there was someone in your family that was also uncomfortable or hurt by these types of things or if they felt this way in a different situation, if I were there as 
difficult as it is for me to do, I would stand up for them and try to be their voice if they didn't have one, just as I'm doing here. So I want you to know it's not just this issue. It's really anything I'm aware of. If I think it's going to hurt somebody I love or that you love or any of us love, we should all be a little more sensitive to that these days. When you say like that, you know, I just want you to know I do this for you. I know you're not aware. I'm trying to be helpful to you and people that you love. Because it tends to be the people who are in that role, people who tend to say things like that, you know, offensive, discriminating, sexist, racist things on a frequent basis, you know, people who tend to think that's no big, no big whoop, they tend to be very protective of their family. They tend to have a very raw, tribal mentality. And when you talk about, I want you to know, I would help you or anyone you know or you love. You must have somebody in your family that has dealt with this before. If I were there and I knew this was happening, I would try to help them and stand up for them when they don't find their own voice. I'd try to do it just like I'm doing now. Tell people that, you know. Then when you're all done, you said, now you said the message, just tell people. Could you think about that for me? Is that asking a lot? Would you try to be more sensitive on that issue for me? When I ask you that, what I'm asking is a closed-ended question. Could you think about that for me? Now, sometimes you will hear me say, I love the closing line. Can I count on you for that? In this case, it's such an uncomfortable situation. And if I'm talking to my boss or another coworker or somebody, it's very easy to slip down that slope and turn into somebody who's offending them to try to remove that, which increases the likelihood that the doors will open and let the message that I'm trying to send in. That's why I'm taking such a passive stance when I talk about these issues. I'm specifically being passive because that's going to increase the odds that you will hear me on a human level. I am not threatening you. I'm not fighting. People who say these types of things in public, sometimes you're looking for a good fight. In fact, frequently are. They are looking for people who are trying to take away Christmas. They're looking for people <laughs> who are trying to, you know, to threaten their, their, their beliefs. They believe as though, they, as they believe their belief system is under attack and they are going around fighting and looking for a good fight. Don't be that fight. Be that gentle, compassionate voice who can actually help them see what they're missing. Because remember, you don't want to choose that battle. You want to illuminate that battlefield. I want to change the, the way people are looking at this. Because as long as we keep looking at these types of issues the same way, we are going to have the same result. We have to change the way we are looking at these issues. It is not about Andrew, you know, and he's, I mean, I can think of a million reasons why the whole world would make fun of him all the time, but I have to look at it differently and realize even, even Andrew <laughs> has feelings, but not even that. I have to look at it differently. Every person that I'm talking about is my brother or my sister, every person that is at a disadvantage or is marginalized or has been hurt or who feels threatened because of who they are, that's my brother you're talking about. And I want you to know that I'm making you aware of this because I would do that for your brother or for you if you needed it. I know you're not aware. So I'm bringing this up so that together you and I can both try and raise the global dialogue one conversation at a time. Do you think we could do that together? And this ends here. How about that? Would you do that for me? Would you think about that? If you can say that to people, they will flip out and they will most likely consider what you said. And you could be that catalyst for change, not just in your office, but really for the whole world. It just takes one person to change the whole world. That's it. And you can do that. I recommend that stance, those words, those phrases, because I've seen them in action. I've seen what they can do. And that is the, the power of, that is strength. That's what strength really is. You're not weak. You are coming from a strong, loving place when you do that. And you can make a big change that way. So I hope that that helps. Uh, again, this is a very specific issue. I'm bringing up to somebody what I saw, what I heard, what you said maybe to me or to somebody else. I recommend doing it in that way. Andrew? Yes. Do we have any uh, particular comments or questions from anybody? Uh, any, anybody? Jupiter is here. Hi, Jupiter! <laughs> He's watching us from Chicago. Oh, I, I love, I, I know Jupiter from Chicago and love it. Thank you for watching, Jupiter. Anybody? Alpha Not Male is watching us from Miami, Florida. Hey, Alpha Not Male from Miami, Florida. You know, I used to live down in the, uh, what do you call it? Uh, where was it? Where did I live? In the, Fargo. No, you <laughs> lived in Fargo. But beach, something right, right, on, right above uh, the 
Boca. There was Bo Delray. I lived in Delray Beach. So I went down to Miami a lot to see my partner, sister, best friend, Crystal Dixon. If you're watching Crystal, hello. And I love Miami Beach, so I hope it's a beautiful day there. Cool. Uh, Regina Roberts says, uh, hi, Andrew and Dan from Apple Valley, California. Hey, Regina. And Alpha Not Male. I have not been to Apple Valley, but I've been everywhere else around that, I think. Yes? And Alpha Not Male says, how should you deal with someone whose comments are more red flags than hurtful? When you say red flags, Alpha Not Male, what do you mean? When they say, oh, you mean comments that would that tend to come before a violent action is that what you mean like uh, comments that tend to signal there's something off with that person is that what you mean i think he refers more like uh, like maybe hurting children or hurting animal like those type of comments oh it's wow then he says that's hi from indianapolis hey <laughs> indianapolis okay alpha not male if somebody, would this be at work? If somebody at work is making comments that are really disturbing you, you know, that, that you know the voice. We all know the voice that tends to whisper to us and say there's something wrong with that. I would never question it because we're never wrong. You know, if I think that, that just triggered the hairs in my back, in the back of my neck to go up because that's some creepy deepy stuff that, you know, it might not have been the thing that they said, but it's the way that they said it, and it tends to only be certain people that say that, you know, those words together. If I'm getting this right. I believe in situations like that, you're talking about safety. And when you, anytime we're talking about safety, you know, I suspect this. Remember that, what was the law called? Or the, the, the there was something that we did in the United States after 9-11, where we encouraged people to like call them out. What, what were you going to say, Andrew? Nothing. You know, there was some there was some movement or some program. Like if you see it, say it, see it, report it. I can't remember what it is. I'm a big believer in that. The avenue that you would take, I believe, is different in every organization. For example, if I'm if I'm working with somebody and I heard them make some comments that were really creepy. I recommend, now this is different from what I would normally recommend, because of the HR professionals that I have worked with, it tends to be that if you are, let's say, the whistleblower, which is what you would be in that situation, they will tell you you'll be anonymous. I mean, we're not even anonymous with whistleblowers in the U.S. government anymore. They are exposed. You know what I mean? Somebody wants to expose them, they're exposed. So. If, if somebody you believe is a dangerous person and you are the one who's ratting on them... The program is called See Something, Say Something. See Something, Say Something. Thank you very much. I believe in the concept, See Something, Say Something. In those situations, however, you're doing it on a hotline. You can hang up and they will not know who you are. If you're talking about at work, I personally do not, would not, trust my career or advancement or livelihood with an HR professional unless I knew them backward and forward. You know what I mean? So I would report that. If you think it's a work thing, I would report it to the you know HR department appropriate person in an anonymous fashion, You know, in a letter, in an email, however it can be. And I know that that's not an upfront way to do it. If you believe somebody's dangerous, you are the one who could be in danger. You know, So I would try to alert the authorities if it's the HR, that way, or you could do it in a pretty much anonymous way. If you were to go to, let's say that you were really concerned about their behavior, you could go to, usually there's public servants, you know, like, uh, you know, even if it is, I had, I had the secret service call me once because, because I was working with this guy down in Florida, down in Florida, I was working with this guy in Florida and he had these tickets to an event. And it turned out to be just a scam. And so I took the tickets and was, I threw them, I was young. I took the tickets and I threw them in the garbage. And apparently he made a case to the Secret Service as though I was taking currency and, because to him it was, and throwing it away. The point of that is you can get the Secret Service involved with little petty issues at work if you, if you know what the number is to call and how to frame it correctly. So I would definitely go to authorities if you believe, if any voice speaks to you, that person is dangerous, 
see something, say something, because that voice is never wrong, uh, alpha, not male. And I, I would absolutely, if I were your friend, your colleague, your coworker, and you mentioned that you thought something was, I would immediately take action because I don't think that voice that tells us that is ever, ever wrong. And if you're in doubt about that, read the book Blink by Malcolm Gladwell. And uh, it, statistically, that voice is going to be right almost always compared to our rational thoughts where we try to justify, should I or shouldn't call, we're doomed. We can't, you know, we, we can't judge something on a conscious basis <laughs> correctly. Uh, yes? Okay, so they say... Uh, Beth says hello from Colombia. Hey, Beth from Colombia, Colombia or Colombia? Uh, Colombia, S-E, South Carolina. <laughs> ah, South Carolina, C, South Carolina. Yes. Hey, Beth. Okay, so Grandma Fan Zero Eight says hello from Brooklyn. Hey, Brooklyn. How do you deal with a, with feeling extremely insulted and unsafe to report the offensive comment pro prohibited behavior? Okay, if you're feeling extremely insulted and you're not comfortable reporting the extremely uh, uh, offensive behavior, I think that's a good example of, uh, it is so rare that reporting behavior is going to serve you. I mean, it's just, it's so rare. And I say that again because the beautiful, fine people that I have worked with in HR tell me stories about people reporting things like this, about the challenges that they have. And almost every time I'm thinking to myself, you totally betrayed them. You know, people came to HR with issues. They are then eventually seen as the problem and pushed out of organizations. And I'm not saying that as a generalization or, you know, I'm saying that's what I have seen and that's what I've experienced is that when we complain about something instead of bringing it to the person, the, you know, the offender, we tend to suffer for that. That's just the way it goes. So I recommend, and I'm glad that you brought this up because this is something that I, I thought about. I recommend always bringing it up with the person and recognizing if you realize this is this unsafe environment in general, there are cultures that you are not going to change. You know, I worked in one that one culture told me that the reason every, every single person got a raise except for me and I was the number one producer at that time and was told flat out, it's because you don't have a wife and kids. They all support families and they needed that raise. And when I was making decisions how to divvy it up, that's the way it went. And I'm like, you made it based on heterosexuality? <laughs> he said, yep. And I thought, okay, this is the wrong environment for me. It's unfortunate that that's the world in which we live, but here's what I do recommend doing because I don't, I'm not a big believer in not taking any action. If you're in a situation like the one that was described where it's, you're, you're hearing these offensive comments, that should not be a possibility in, uh, in the workplace in the United States. The United States has laws, but that's irrelevant. The United States should be, in addition to its laws, a safe place for all workers. That's one of the things that we started out really emphasizing. We, wanna, we don't want children losing limbs in factories. So we have laws against that. We have, we have, more importantly, a mindset that protects children. If that mindset does not exist where you work, you're going to be in jeopardy and you're gonna have uh, you're going, to, you're going to be unsafe and you'll have these types of situations. People will say outrageously insulting things that offend you. If that's happening, it's not about the person that says that. It's about the environment in which you are working that is allowing that or creating a safe place for those comments. What I have seen create miracles is someone going to, let's say that, it, let's say that you're going to go talk to your boss about this. Okay, what's Beth? Is that it from Columbia? It's, give me a sec. Is, is that the... Drama fan, zero. Drama fan, I apologize. If drama fan, you figure, I've had these talks, I've, I've done my best, I have really done my best, and, and I like this environment, and there's potential here, it's really about a really select group of people, because if it's an overwhelming group of people, you know, I'm not going to go to the White House and try to change it, if I wanted to. I'm not saying there's anything good or bad about the White House. Right now, the 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 culture in the White House is not one that an outsider like Dan O'Connor could go in and change if I were to try, right? I'm not going to make that mistake. But listen, if I were in the White House, <laughs> if I were in where you work, where does drama fan work? Uh, what type, did, did they mention what type of an environment it is? No. Okay. Let's say that you worked at the Dave and Buster's, I don't know, in Wheaton, Illinois. And, <laughs> and I was recognizing this going on. If I thought I was going to go to my boss, 
and talk about this. What I would say is, and I say this because I have seen people do this with IBM and change the Latin American division. Thank you, Gabriel Gomez, for doing that. When this happened to Gabriel Gomez, a situation similar to the one I believe you're describing, he went to the general manager or supervisor, and the stance I would take would be this. I'm not sure exactly what he said. Here's how I would say it. I really love working here, and I've come to you today not to complain, but to tell you that there are some areas that you are really vulnerable, and I'd like to help with that. I notice we do not have a you know, diversity or uh, inclusion department. I would like the opportunity and the honor of starting that up in my free time. You know, I could be your new director of diversity and inclusion and talk about all the, the things that go with that. You know, that's what Gabrielle Gomez did with IBM. I mean, people will think I can't do that. Really? You could do it with IBM. You know, he went into them and said, you know, you don't, you don't have a director of diversity here. And he was a computer programmer. He said, why don't I do that for you in my spare time? It'll be fun and it will help a lot of people. And what I will do when I do that is, because I love this company so much, I'm going to help you know, tie up some of the loose ends that are really exposing this company to litigation and problems, and more importantly than anything else, misunderstandings and hurt feelings that are not necessary. You know what I mean? Things that distract us from work so that we can be more focused on the job. Would you allow me the opportunity to do this? And then I will show you in a year the results that I've got and how it's really improved this company's bottom line. Can I do that for you? If you do something like that, like if you want to make that change, present that. And you'd be amazed how many people will say, whatever, do it, go right ahead. Because if you don't have a director, if you do have a director of diversity and inclusion and things like that, those things shouldn't happen. If they are, I would go to them. If you don't have one, start it up. And you would be amazed how much more valuable that would make almost any position. And like Gabrielle, when he did it, he was all of a sudden he was traveling the world, going to all these conventions. He wrote his own ticket and he wrote it right out of IBM, by the way. But he's enjoyed his life ever since then because what he did was he saw a problem and he changed the whole world. And in doing so, he changed himself because that's ipso facto what happens. And he empowered himself in a whole different way. And I hope that drama... What is it? Drama, Dra fan. drama fan. I hope drama fan, if you find yourself in a situation like that, again, illuminate it. Change the way you're looking at it. And instead of thinking, what am I going to do about this, about this person, what can I do to change the environment, the world, so that this is not an acceptable form of behavior? It's not even thought of. It's, it's so that I change the battlefield. How can I do that? Because you can, and you'd be amazed. By the way, then if you do that, even if they just say, go ahead, make sure to say, can I use the title of Director of Diversity and Inclusion? <laughs> you know, And if they say, sure, go ahead. You're doing it in your spare time, right? Yes, I will charge you nothing. I will only show you results once they've been achieved. And if they haven't been achieved after a year, you can drop the program. Great. Now I can say when, you know, Mar Johnny starts telling his offensive jokes, then you can preface what you're going to say with things such as, you know, Johnny, as the director of diversity and inclusion, I would caution you and ask you to reflect on those types of comments before you'd say them. You know, I mean, just you, when you start to say things like as the director of diversity and inclusion, and you will find that will empower you and then everyone else in a whole different way. So that's the way I would, if I have not gotten the results and I think, okay, I'm, I don't want to leave here. It's worth it. I'm going to go talk to the boss. Instead of talking to the boss about somebody that he probably or she probably likes more than you. Come there with a solution to a problem they didn't even know they had. And look at you're going to save them. You're going to stop. And you're going to plug up the holes. Uh, what do you call it? The, uh, the, where they're exposed. Cover that up. Protect them. And all for free. Can you imagine that? Almost any company would let you do that if they do not already have a department like that. Anything else that we have, Andrew? I think that's that is it I don't know why you all stick with me for so long those who did thank you so much it's been 40 minutes I gotta go I know you have things to do people to see places to go Andrew and Dan from Dan Ricardo training thank you all so much and remember by the way if you have not yet stopped by the website in a while stop by and if there's something wrong with it tell me because there have been things wrong with the website and I want to make sure that if you go to buy something you can we have programs memberships uh, audios, videos, books, and somebody just asked me about my book, Energy Vampire Slaying 101. Yes, you can get it on the website or Amazon, either one. For everybody here at Dan O'Connor Training, this is Dan O'Connor and Andrew, signing off.